This is a Culture Inject production. The Nevers Podcast presents Firefly Back in the Skies. You know, it's funny, we went to the war never looking to come back, but it's, it's the real world I couldn't survive. You two carried me through that war, and now I need you to carry me just a little bit further, if you can. Hello, hello, hello. Welcome back to all of our listeners. Welcome to our retrospective series firefly back in the skies i am laura and i am tig and this week we are watching the fan favorite episode the message a former independent soldier who has served with mal and zoe returns in a dramatic manner with a vicious alliance officer chasing after him for some unusual smuggled cargo this episode first aired july 28th 2003 (laughs) let's not think about how far yeah how long ago that was (laughs) So our cast and crew for this episode, we have, of course, the usual players with guest appearances from Jonathan M. Woodward as Tracy Smith and Richard Berge as Lieutenant Womack. Uh, this episode was written by Joss Whedon and Tim Minear and directed by Tim Minear. Absolute legendary combo. When you see that in the credits, you know you're in for a good episode. And it's not just the writing he did. So a little behind the scenes information. Joss Whedon actually makes an uncredited cameo in this episode, playing one of the family members at Tracy's funeral. And the composer, Greg Edmondson, stated that he felt the music he wrote for the funeral might be too pretty, as he wrote it not about Tracy's death, but about his farewell to the series. The cast and crew were aware that Firefly had been cancelled at this point in the show's run. This actually Mm. kind of low-key confirms something I've heard thrown around. I'm never sure if it's actually true or if it's just one of the many bits of mythology that have grown up around this series in the time since it first aired. But I had heard that they got the news the show had been cancelled just as they were recording Tracy's funeral and the reason everyone Mm. in that scene looks so... They look like they're really grieving... It's not just because they're all amazing actors, but also because they had literally just been told this was the last episode and the last scene they were ever going to record. So they're not just grieving for Tracy, they're also grieving for the show that they've the lost. Show. Not sure if that's mm. true, but I kind of I like to think it is because it's just a, a great little bit of lore. It definitely could be. I think like with show cancellations and stuff like that, a lot of the time they're so out of the blue and it would literally just be like on set one day oh by the way uh yeah this is it Mm. (laughs) which is uh unfortunate obviously Mm. but yeah it definitely um definitely that scene but i think uh i mentioned it later on in my notes that i made but um i think the the episode as a whole um there's a lot more feel and a lot more kind of Mm. like um, kind of true emotion coming through i think from pretty much the whole cast so i think if it wasn't that scene, it might have even been, you know, the whole episode because I think there's definitely um, like a real somber mood in this. Absolutely, this yeah. Episode. But um, could you spot Joss in the end scene? I could not. I've seen this episode a million billion times, and every time I completely forget he's meant to be there somewhere, and I, I, I just, I never see him because he's, he's got quite. I was a, looking. Sort of a unique. He, he wouldn't be hard to pick out in a crowd. No, no, because yeah. I know in. Um, in Angel, when they go to Lorne's homeworld, he's like the the one of the brothers Is he? or the cousins or whatever, <laughs> and he he's he's in the makeup dancing in the background when the mum's like I can't remember his name, but do the dance goes, of victory um, thingy, yeah, do the dance of joy, do the dance of whatever. That's I, I do believe that that's Joss Whedon. Uh, I- I do recall hearing that before, so yeah, like, I think <laughs> that could well be true, and that is that is amazing because. I love that episode because it's both, it has that. And I believe it's also the first appearance of Fred, who obviously Fred, I have yep. something of a weak spot for. <laughs> so yeah, like I can, that is hilarious and I love that. But yeah, I couldn't spot him, I couldn't spot him in this bit, but it might well be that he's there, but a lot of the time, you know, you shoot stuff and you can't actually see it in the yeah. final edit. 
Or he maybe he's wearing a, a big hat or something, so he can, it's, <laughs> he's hidden. Possibly. That's a cover up the ginger hair. Yeah. You can stand out too much. Mm. Anyway, moving from Joss on to our episode. So, um, start from the beginning, as we should. Uh, the episode opens on a space station. Inside, um, a bark of praises an exhibit featuring proof of alien life. Inside, Simon and Kaylee stare at a tall, illuminated cylinder that holds a strange and apparently dead creature. Simon uses his time alone with Kaylee to attempt to get closer to her. Still, he once again puts his foot in his mouth when he mentions that the only other women he knows are either married, uh, Zoe, professional, Inara, or related to him, River, his sister. And Kaylee leaves in a half Come on, Simon. Like, what are you doing, man? Yeah, for such a smart guy, he can be a real dumbass sometimes. Like, you can kind of see what he was trying to say, but, mate, don't phrase it that way. There's no... Yeah, he... Like, he went from being really complimentary and, like, really, like, successfully flirting mm. with her and they was having this really nice moment to... And you know what? You know, you're the only woman I could have, really, so... Kind of stuck with you. Uh. <laughs> oh, Thanks. Thanks. <laughs> But it is funny that she is the only woman really available to him and he still can't land her. <laughs> yep. <laughs> like, uh, that's how much of a, a, of a klutz he is, yeah. Wow. <laughs> and, and but I love, that um, I love that Kaylee is, you know, we're always like, oh, Kaylee, she's so cute and everyone looks after her. But she knows how to stand up for herself. Like, he, as soon as he says something wrong, she's like, you're a dick, basically, you know, straight up. <laughs> so, yeah. She's fierce, I love her. She's had enough practice over by now, I suppose. But yeah, mouth <laughs> unraised her right. She can stick up for herself. <laughs> yeah, speaking of, as Kaylee departs, Zoe and Wash enter, the latter declaring, ah, it's grotesque, before noticing, oh, there's something in a jar. Brilliant line. <laughs> Wash mockingly tries to communicate with the alien, and Zoe manages to console and insult Simon. Mal checks in with the station's postmaster, who passes along two packages with Serenity's mail back in the concourse. I just, that whole scene in the sort of uh, you know, freak show, I guess you could call it, is brilliant. I just love when it's um, Zoe's line. That, yep. that appears to be a recipe for cake. That's not the right one. There we go. Uh, <laughs> Zoe's line, yeah. Uh, it was Simon, Simon this, says, this may surprise you, but I'm not good at talking to women. Zoe, is there someone you are good at talking to? <laughs> yeah. Oh, so good. Like Considering Simon is a dumbass and manages to talk his way into a number of problems. Like, you couldn't get any better than that. It's such a perfect little cut down. He doesn't get all of the, not abuse, but like, you know, all of the banter. He doesn't get all of it, but like he is the main target. And he's yeah. so easy for them, right? To yeah. like, because he's just such an easy target. He really is. Like he, he makes it too easy sometimes. It almost seems unfair to keep picking on him. But oh. I mean, he makes it hard not to pick on him. So it's really his own fault when you think about it. Yeah. And I think this episode um, loosely, like, well, I say loosely, one of the things it actually kind of greatly features on is Simon and Kaylee's relationship mm. in terms of the fact that when, obviously, we get our extra man aboard, um, it kind of opens up this, like, oh, you know, I should treat you really well because there are other guys and, mm. you know, she doesn't have to settle for me kind of thing. Um, yeah, and they kind of... Uh, have a nice little journey through this episode um, amidst the chaos that's going on. Yes. But this episode does raise one interesting question. So, obviously, yeah, this is a, a sci fi series, space exploration, other planets, brave new worlds, yada, yada. But there are no aliens in it. Do you think if the series had gone on, there would have been either hints or outright appearances of alien races and cultures? Do you know what? Um,. I've always, like, my personal opinion is that, like, or, like, speculation on aliens is that if, so so far as we know, the only planet that can inhabit life is ours, then you can kind of assume that any other planet that would have life would be almost similar, if not identical to ours, and be, like, human-noid, at least. So I think that, like, even... Because in this verse, obviously, these are humans that have travelled and occupied other planets, mm -hmm. right? Everyone is a human of Earth, yeah, and then uh, beyond. So, um, but yeah, I think even if there were aliens on other planets, 
they'd have to be habitable planets, which means they'd probably be like ours anyway, and they'd probably be very humanoid. But um, I think that this show is is really nice because it gives you that grounding. You know, we have like shows like Star Trek and things with like all kinds of alien races, and it's great to see. But it's nice to have this show being something different, where it's like it's just it's just humans mm. out in the universe, and and the real enemy is obviously the Reavers, mm. and they're kind of like kind of alien because no one really knows what their origin is and what they are um but yeah i don't think i don't think they would have introduced aliens because it's nice that it's just like i don't know it's just like a western in space isn't it (laughs) true i mean if you want to see firefly but with aliens just watch farscape basically yeah this is my thing it's like there's other shows right for that but i mean the, the, the interesting part is like this is that's what they mentioned. Oh, it's proof of alien life, and they're still quite skeptical about it. But watching the show until they mentioned, oh, aliens don't exist in this universe, you don't You're really notice they're it. missing. It doesn't like even though it is a sci-fi show and it is all about space exploration and you know pulling jobs in the in the verse. You don't notice the lack of alien life. Mm. So I think they probably could have continued without it. Yeah. But I, mean, I think it, it might, might have been quite nice to tease a little kind of hint that there is something greater out there. And yeah, maybe if the show had mm. run to like five, six seasons and they were running out of plots <laughs> and <some> aliens. But <laughs> We need some yeah. ideas in the writing table. Exactly. Aliens. <laughs> yes. Hell yeah. Let's do it. Or, yeah. you know, after, what year was Alien um, Resurrections? Oh, that's a good call. Because I think after, after Joss Whedon dealt with that, he probably never wanted to hear the word alien again. <laughs> Very, very possible. <laughs> Although I have to say, I do love that movie. So, but I do like that it's yeah different and it's grounded and it's kind of like seeing all these cool aliens is like great. But it's also nice to have a show that's like really grounded and mm. kind of like oh we don't need all these like fancy aliens and also budget wise they spent that, so much yes. money yeah like having to spend a substantial amount of money on 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 um, effects and like visual makeup and stuff is. Uh, would be another huge thing. So I think this show does really well on a low budget. You know, the CGI mostly just comes in the certain space scenes yeah. and the ship, of course. That's the big expense was the real spaceship on the set. But the rest, like the costume and everything else seems kind of like, you know, it's rough and tough. They probably just got all these like cargo trousers and whatever <laughs> from thrift stores yeah. and threw all these costumes together. Well, I mean, the, 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 uh, the, the Alliance Troopers all use the costume from Starship Troopers. The Alliance uniform is just yeah. the Sergeant Trooper's uniform. The army, yeah. Which is also used There's a lot of else. shows that do that. I'm trying to think of the guns because when, uh, on, on Trash actually, when they picked up the gun that shoots like the ray and like just pushes people over and doesn't harm them. Yeah. And I was looking at it like, what is that gun from? Because I definitely recognise it. But um, I think Stargate uses guns, in, the same guns as something else I've seen. So a lot of them, yeah, they use the same the same props because it's cheaper to go and get, yeah. you know, props from a prop house than, especially if you're at a studio like, you know, Universal or whatever, and they've got it all there yeah. um, for you to use. So why not? Indeed. Jane arrives to find that his mother has sent him a home-knitted cap and he proudly dons it. Uh, the others observe the hideous headgear with a mixture of amusement and sarcasm. The other shipped item is a huge crate addressed to Mal and Zoe. And when they open it inside, they discover a dead body. Bum, bum, bum. Bum, 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 bum. We go from silly hat to dead body. <laughs> yeah, obviously, like, super famous lines, obviously. They're like, well, how's it sitting? He, he says, how's it sitting? Pretty cunning, don't you think? So the whole pretty cunning, don't you think? That's like a... It's an easy go-to quote. Yeah, I mean, like, it's spawned so many kind of fat on uh, Etsy. Just, just all the Firefly merch is just Jane's hat. There's, apparently there's even a song about it, which I haven't heard, but I can assume is shiny as hell. But I think one line <laughs> that gets glossed over in that scene, they're all arriving kind of just before the post is opened and, uh, you know, they're all kind of struggling to eat their ice planets and Jane mocks River for not knowing how to do it. But, I mean... It's a large block of ice on a string. How the frack are you supposed to eat that thing? It looks <laughs> impossible. I don't understand how you're supposed to consume that without looking much like River did. It's very strange. But they're all, they're all like, that's just a normal thing of a her. She's like, mm. my food's being problematic. Or... <laughs> She's very like just trying to highly assess 
how to eat this thing. Um, yeah, they're great. Yeah. Um, oh, the other hat line. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Man walks down the street in that hat. People know he's not afraid of anything. <laughs> <laughs> and this is like, you know, in Jane's head, he's working out like, that's yeah, that's serious. I mean, they, he, they really mean that. Whereas in their heads, it's like... <laughs> Uh, because it's so silly yeah. only someone that's not a, not afraid of what people think <laughs> would put that hat on <laughs> and go outside in it exactly um oh uh, and my actual one of my favorite lines jane is very strong in this episode i think as mm. like a character as opposed to his normal um like you know just generally idiotic you know burly man character <laughs> yeah. um when they open the crate and he's like what do y'all order a get dead guy for <laughs> Yeah, that is a good one. <laughs> it's just oh. like, oh, it's a good one. <laughs> That's right. That that has to be the it's probably one of the, one of if not the most quoted scenes in all of Firefly. Like, there's so many great lines just in that one sort of two minute scene. It's quite special. But also, I think a, a detail that I've missed on previous watches, but of course this time, when Jane is stumbling over the letter from his mother, he mentions that he sends lots of his credits home and that kind of helps them survive. I'm like, it's, 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 a, it's a throwaway line. No one even knows it, but it does add another kind of mm. layer to the character of Jane. Like, you know, he comes across as this sort of big, burly, sort of, you know, do anything for the right price guy. But you have to wonder, like, just what percentage of his credits is he sending home? Like, I wouldn't be surprised if it was a lot more than people thought it was. Like I have a distinct suspicion a lot of his work is just to keep his family safe and he's not doing it just because he loves shooting people. Yeah, because if you think about like, what do they really have to spend their money on? They seem to be mostly working, right? And mm. other than buying nicer food than basic rations and like rule or whatever they eat... Um, other than buying, yeah, that, like, what other luxuries do you really get? When you're living on a ship, they seem perfectly content with that life. It's kind of like, what are you spending any extra money on? Mm. Or do you save it for, like, you know, the future when you don't want to do this job anymore? Yeah. But um, I think, yeah, for him, if he's sending it all home, and it's just, yeah, it's just nice because a lot of the time you see these characters and you don't think about whether they have family. Yeah. You know, we've seen, we know that Kaylee does. We know that she, you know, when when she was offered the job, oh, I'm just going to have to run home and, like, check with my dad or whatever. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um but but yeah like you kind of assume that Zoe and Wash only have each other yeah. and you know and that they a lot of them don't really have any family ties so for Jane to be the one that has a family somewhere that he's supporting or helping support is uh yeah it's a nice extra touch to his character we then get one of the best flashbacks in the series for me Seven years earlier, the Battle of Dukang, a young independent soldier, Private Tracy Smith, calmly prefers a meal of cold beans behind cover when an Alliance soldier starts to sneak up on him. Just as the latter is about to shoot, Zoe appears behind him and slices his throat. While she lectures the boy about stealth, Malcolm Reynolds, Sergeant Malcolm Reynolds, hero of the rebellion, comes screaming over some obstacles, shouting, shooting, and crashes into them. Tracy's injured when the Alliance zeroes in on them. Mal and Zoe grab Tracy and their shell shock lieutenant and bug out. Never has there been a single scene that so perfectly encapsulates two characters as this one. Like the whole, she's like you know being kind of the stoic badass. Like yeah, yeah, you've got to you've got to be quiet and like. Oh, I'd kill two guys. I didn't hear anything. That's sort of the point. Gotta be stealthy. Then Mal comes in. I am Mal. Hear me roar. Shoot all the things. Uh, it's completely insane, but just so <laughs> so good. It is the best. Mm. Like yeah, don't don't don't, don't ever let you, them know where you are. She says, and then yeah, Mal charges in. I'm right here. <laughs> <laughs> firing the guns yeah it's um makes you wonder like how they survived well he probably survived because he's got zoe yes. um because he is yeah just like a bit of a crazy he's not just like a soldier there doing what he's told like he he thoroughly believes why he's there mm. and as well when they're backed into a corner like this it's kind of like you go all out don't you yeah. like he's there he's there to fight to the end and um yeah luckily they survived it's just <laughs> nice to see another scene with them back um when they were in the war when there was like soldier buddies because so far all we've seen is the very like opening mm. of the TV show um, which was a much more serious yeah 
you know, note because it was uh, showing us the end of the war. And um, yeah, this was, yeah, nice to see. Nice to see. They've got a little bit of, of a change up. They've got kind of a tank and DPS dynamic going on. Mal's out there like shouting and screaming yeah. and shooting things because because he knows he's safe to do that because he's got Zoe sneaking around, stabbing people quietly. And she knows she's free to be stealthy and go around some people because all the, she knows all the eyes will be on Mal. Like he's out there, you know, drawing the fire so that she can stealth around and do what she does best. It's, it's, that's probably how they like, they know they can support each other and play with each other. Like it seems like a throwaway jokey scene, but it captures quite a lot about their characters and their dynamic. It's very well yeah. played. And, um, you know, they look after the little guy. So they do. They help Tracy after Tracy, you know, with the explosion, he gets hit with a polystyrene rock. <laughs> <laughs> he, he's bad. He's like, is it bad? And I'm like, it was, yeah, it's just a polystyrene block, mate. You're probably fine. We'll get off. <laughs> you just see it like bonk off his head. <laughs> oh, love, love movie magic. It's great. No, no, it was very good, honestly. <laughs> so anyway, moving on from our... Um, a very nice scene with polystyrene blocks. Um, back in the present, the two ex-soldiers puzzle over their former comrades to set. Uh, ooh, sorry, their former comrades' decently preserved corpse. Hauling the box aboard Serenity, they find a recorded message from Tracy. He anticipated trouble from some unsavoury associates and has asked them to ship his body home to Saint Albans. I think with this one, the. I was trying to think. It's River in this bit that's great, but I've not. I can't think of what she says now. No, I'm sorry, I've, I've gone blank on that one as yeah, well. Yeah, I. I don't know why I've written River brilliant, but not why. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. But she's brilliant. Uh, yeah. So what I what I really love about that scene is the, the part I really love about that scene is when they're like, oh, they see it, and he's like, oh, get us to Dorbans, and Walsh just kind of wanders away, and they're like, what are you doing? He's like, well. It's a, you know, it's a short run to St. Albans. If we burn, we can be there in a couple of days. And everyone's just like, of course, like the kind of the quiet acceptance that this is what they need to do because they know in, in like, if it, if the positions were reversed in kind of any other situation, Mao would do whatever he could to help one of their friends you know, make that final journey. And just the whole crew can see that it's important to Mao and Zoe that this guy gets back to their, back to his home, back to his family. And like, th- you know, Washes straight away goes to the pilot. Inara's like, it's all good. I can be late. It's you know, it's just one meeting. It does, doesn't matter. But we need to, we need to complete this final mission. It's like, there's there's about four words said in the whole scene, but like, it's just the message is so clear, and it's it's really it's a really beautifully done scene with very minimal dialogue, which is sort of the opposite of what you usually get from a Whedon scene. Usually, it's all about the dialogue. But yeah, way, and I think that's what I was yeah. saying about the kind of like the mood of this um, exactly. episode. Every, everything's very like deep and undertone and it's um, like that. I like, you know, he starts to head to to the bridge and you see Mal kind of give a look almost like he thinks Wash is being disrespectful and then Wash is like, well, you know, we can get there in a couple of days. Mm. It's like, oh, respect, yeah, respect. And yeah, Anara's like, it's fine. Yeah, it's, 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 it's nice to see um, how they all come together for a person they don't know. And yeah. that's the like, um, I think I mentioned this later on, um, you know, and it talks about like reactions to death and stuff like that. So this is someone who's died. None of them know this person apart from Mal and Zoe, but they all have this sense of respect and they're all like seem very deeply saddened by it, even though mm. they don't know this person. So um, when they live such dangerous lives and encounter death quite a lot, really, it's interesting to see them react to kind of what is a normal death. You know, yeah. here we have a body in a coffin and it's like an actual, like it's actually happening, whereas everything else is very chaotic. People are dying left, right and centre and then they fly off in their ship and don't really have to think about it. Here they have, you know, a dead body in a coffin that they're trying to get home. So it's it's very real, I think, yeah. for them. Like Hits home. But yeah. Hits home. Mm. But also it's worth noting in Tracy's message, he says he dresses Malcolm Reynolds, but then he just says Zoe. It's like, come on, man, I wanted to know what Zoe's maiden name was. Obviously this he he knows them from the war. So Zoe wouldn't have been married to Wash at that point because she hadn't even met him. Like I wanted to know what her maiden name. Why did he just address her Zoe? Like, I want to know her full name. Damn you. What is your name? Yeah. <laughs> Who are you? I don't know why it matters, but it does. <laughs> so um, 
back on the station, an ominous alliance law officer, uh, lieutenant, well, Lieutenant Womack, or if you're not English, Lieutenant, <laughs> very sorry, <laughs> Lieutenant Womack, I should say. Um, I don't know why that word is so differently weird. But, um, Britain, we do weird shit. Yeah, <laughs> what, what is with English, yeah. <laughs> Um, Lieutenant Womack enters with two goons. Uh, he threatens first to imprison and incinerate the postmaster, Amnon, uh, who quickly tells the man and his aides who left with the coffin-sized package. Poor guy. Like, first of all, he didn't know he was transporting that body. And when he found out it was a body, like, with when, when he handed it over to Mal and Zoe, he's like, <gasps> we cannot... Like, this can not yeah. put the lid back on. Get us out of here. Like, and hurry up about it. Like, this is not allowed. Um, but obviously, like, how is he supposed to know? I don't know. if they're supposed to scan everything? Or, do, you know, I don't know what the rules are in space post, but... Um... But there appear to be very few, so <laughs> I'm sure he didn't have to. <laughs> yeah, but this guy, I think, is... Yeah, I think pretty scary, right? Yeah. He's, he's an alliance officer, but he's, he's not like the alliance officers we've seen as of yet, you know, in their, like fancy suits and mm. very upright he's he's clearly you know not impartial to torturing people and stuff no. um yeah so it was pretty pretty scary yeah he also delivers an absolutely fantastic line and there's, there's this whole kind of prison bitch speech which i thought was a little bit over the top i don't, don't think it was strictly necessary and they're talking to then he's like oh yeah you know um transporting a body that's you know five ten years and, he's, and then he just looks and goes and you don't know this yet but you resisted arrest. <laughs> oh, Jesus Christ, dude. <laughs> what what line? What, what is that, man? Come on. Like, we get it. You're a bad guy. You're not averse to breaking the rules. But just give it a rest. That's a bit <laughs> much. <laughs> I can't help but laugh every time he drops it. It's like, come on, man. Ah, oh, come on, dude. Next up, we actually have another very strong... Jane scene as you said earlier this is a good episode of him this is a, p- a particularly good monologue from him back on Serenity Jane waxes surprisingly philosophical about death to Shepard Burke who contemplates a modest ceremony for the deceased Jane notes that he always gets the urge to do stuff when he sees a corpse he didn't have to kill prompting Burke to speculate that Jane likes to prove to himself that he's still alive after witnessing death Meanwhile, Mal and Zoe uh, entertain Inara with a hilarious tale about Tracy's antics during the war, when suddenly the ship is taken by a near miss from an Alliance craft. Lieutenant Womack howls them and demands to board Serenity. The crew mistakenly thinks that Womack is after the Lassiter. When Womack mentions that crate, however, Mal realises uh, he's after Tracy's coffin and stalls the time while they take apart the crate to discover what secrets it might contain. Oh, (laughs) again, we're going from like, um, you've got quite mellow with Jane and we're getting pretty deep here. And then we go to like the, obviously, uh, book mentions how people process death differently. So then cut straight to them all laughing at the dinner table, talking about old stories. And then, as you mentioned earlier, then we have River lying on the coffin. Um, So, yeah, it's... (laughs) A lot of different reactions. Uh, we also see, is it at this point we see Kaylee in her bunk listening to the message again? Is this at the I, th- I think so. It's, it's around yeah, that time. So, yeah, they're all, everyone's getting, you know, kind of processing this differently. Yeah. Kind of, Kaylee's become quite introspective and is just going over the message. Uh, Mal and Anara and that lot kind of celebrate and Zoe is celebrating the the life of the departed and Jane's being surprisingly philosophical. I, I, I think it's a very clever way of showing sort of all the different ways people deal with it while having a conversation about the different ways people deal with it. It could be a little on the nose, but I think they, they get it. They, they, they do it pretty well. I mean, Joss and Tim, they, they don't mess around when it comes to script writing. They know what they're doing. I also must mention how lovingly Anara is looking at Mal yeah. while he's telling telling a happy story you know he's telling a story about uh, what although it was during the war a time that he obviously like loved what he was doing he was fighting for a cause and that's like where he felt right and um yeah she's just like oh mal she's she's loving it yep but um i think the funniest bit out of all of this is um 
when the message comes through and he's like stalling <laughs> to wash yeah. and wash is like what am i gonna do shadow puppets <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's nice to see jane feeling hmm. thinking through <laughs> and it's what he does and i think he and book have a really nice relationship because obviously they work out together yeah. sometimes and it's like you know they've got that kind of relationship where either neither of them talk very much whilst they spend time together or maybe just book like talks about random stuff and Jane just kind of listens and takes it in. But, you know, he's not a great talker, so he probably doesn't enjoy, probably doesn't usually enjoy talking about stuff like this because he's not really like into it and, do, you know, doesn't know a lot of words or whatever. That doesn't mean that he doesn't, that doesn't mean he doesn't think about it or feel about it. He just might not be good at communicating because, you know, he didn't go to school or whatever. Indeed. I don't know. But. <laughs> but- I think that is one slight missed opportunity in this show. Like, they do kind of build up the relationship between Jane and Book a little bit. I'm sure if they'd had more chance, it would have gone further, yada, yada, yada. That's <laughs> where I've said something along those lines in basically every episode so far. But that's because <laughs> basically every episode, there's been a plot point that I feel would have developed further. But let's not get let's yeah. not get on that rant now. I feel like <laughs> Book and Jane's relationship was developing into quite a kind of brothers in arms kind of camaraderie opposites attract type friendship but then it gets to serenity and sadly book you know closes and it feels like jane doesn't really like you see mal reacts quite strongly kaylee reacts quite strongly inara reacts quite strongly he jane doesn't really react like even as much as the others i kind of feel like they could have really kind of had that as him being like galvanized ready for action now and they didn't i kind of feel like they were building in that direction in the series and they didn't really pay off like he should have been the one that was most upset and that should have been a chance for jane to kind of show a bit of his character but it, it just doesn't, doesn't really happen and i thought i always thought it was a bit weird yeah i think unfortunately because it's a movie and like they probably want that like, the studio want the yeah. movie to be uh good as a standalone for people that haven't necessarily watched the show and for that, they're probably like, why would you have your big... Why is a big burly guy going to get upset about some dude dying? He wouldn't care. Like, do you know what I mean? And then they're like, oh, okay, we won't we won't have him react too greatly. Yeah, don't put too much character development in this small movie. Boo. What are you doing? <laughs> the, two, the two worst words in cinema. Studio interference. Anywho, finding nothing on board after searching the... Uh, coffee and they decide to have simon autopsy the hapless soldier but the doctor's first incision causes the dead man to leap up and struggle with the gathered crew after he calms down tracy confesses he's in fact smuggling illegal internal organs that he was supposed to deliver to ariel but he got a higher bid unfortunately for him the original buyers found out about his little side business and killed the new customers and are now after their stolen merchandise I swear, the first time I saw this episode, not knowing at all what was going to happen, I absolutely shat myself when he jumped off the table. Like, this is this is a series where we've already had kind of Reavers and we've seen people in near-death states pop up and start doing horrible things. Like, I really thought he was going to be a Reaver and freak out and start murdering them all or something. And he just jumps like, for God's sakes, man, please stop. I was not ready for that at all. Yeah, and after the scary moment where he jumps up, he has a little bit of a wrestle with um, with Mao, and then we get the nice little reunion. He's like, you know, first of all, I think he mentions about like why why is that guy cut, cutting into me or whatever. <laughs> Mao like kind of like brings him to, and then he's like, um, Sarge, I think I'm naked, <laughs> and he says it like that, like naked. <laughs> um, the other ship so basically we get two more shots from Waymac to remind them of their immediate peril um wash takes her entity down to st albans where they try unsuccessfully to elude their pursuer in a narrow snowbound valley they finally come to rest inside a hidden cave but the alliance ship drops explosive charges into the valley to flush them out that's no good mm. so good <laughs> oh god <laughs> It was an accident. It was an accident. Sure, it was. Yeah. It, was. <laughs> it happened. <laughs> oh, I'm going to get fired now. <laughs> Court martialed. Uh, there is one really great moment in this, in that kind of the, the chase scene. Wash is doing his wash thing and he's like, 
he throws on he's oh yeah I lost it. I'm so badass and then he kind of looks up he's like oh why didn't I think of that and you see the plane just flying above them like hello bomb so good it's like as a general rule Wash fails quite a lot at everything else but when it comes to flying there's no one in the verse like when it comes to flying 99 times out of 100 he will win whatever exchange they're in and that, but this is the one time where he's doing his flying thing and gets slightly shown up and it's, it's very funny mm. I do enjoy it I thought I thought you was going to mention um because in the same bit when he because Tracy goes up onto the bridge right mm. and Wash <laughs> Wash's reaction to <sighs> seeing because everybody else has met him already yeah. But Wash has been up distracting Womack, right? <laughs> and he walks on and he's just like, because there's a dead guy. <laughs> Why is there a dead guy on my bridge? What? Why is there a dead guy? Oh, so uh, good. Brilliant. Wash has so many great lines. I love Wash. Yeah. So Kaylee gets to know and flirts slightly with our young soldier friend whose words have so mesmerized her earlier book does some checking on their alliance pursuers and discovers some bizarre behaviors he ultimately recommends to mal that they allow the feds to board the ship tracy overhears some of this conversation and pulls a gun on the crew mal expresses disgust at his former subordinates attempt to force them to get him out of his mess and orders wash to call the feds to the shock and surprise of literally no one tracy turns out to be a bit of a ne'er-do-well what a surprise. Who could have guessed that it's a Joss Whedon show where uh, John Woodward shows up and he turns out not to be on the up and up? That's never happened oh, no. before. Not literally oh. every single time this guy has appeared on any of Whedon's shows. He's as much of a walking spoiler as Sean. Like anytime Sean Bean shows up, you know he's not living to the end of the series. Anytime Woodward shows up, you know he's going to come in with his fucking sad puppy dog eyes. Like, oh... I'm just a poor, sad little man. He, I'm I'm harmless, honestly. Oh, wait, no, actually, I'm a horrible person because I'm a horrible <laughs> person. Yeah, it's just like, it's sad to see that without even talking to Mal and Zoe and trying to reason with them, he overhears that and just straight up pulls a gun on him because you're like, whoa, 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 these dudes saved your life probably on multiple occasions and you've asked them to transport your body, which they were doing very nicely, and uh, now you're putting a gun on them and, like, threatening to shoot them, and it's just, um, it's not good. No, it's not cricket. It's, yeah, it... it, it you, you have to wonder Paul how Phil, many boy. times have Mal and Zoe pulled some ridiculous plan off to drag Tracy's nuts out of the fire. Like, how many times have they, has he seen them pull, you know, ploys just like this? And it's implied he knows what who they are and what they've been up to since the end of the war. So he must know they've got a bit of a reputation for outlandish schemes. Like, how could he assume they were mm. trying to sell him out? It's just, like, come on, man. Yeah, this is as- Mal Reynolds we're talking about here. He doesn't <clears throat> betray his crew. And as um, viewers, after seeing Book's reaction to their like credentials mm. and stuff and seeing that there was a base nearby and they've not contacted for backup and that, we know as viewers that they're pulling something. It's like, oh, well, obviously, you know, something's going on and they're, they're, they've got a plan up their sleeves. Um, and Tracy just comes in and ruins <sighs> it. Oh, Tracy. This is why you never made captain, Tracy. You don't get the bigger picture here as tracy fires at wash wounding him slightly zoe shoots the ungrateful man in the chest injured but not slowing down tracy grabs kaylee for cover and heads for the cargo bay when mal confronts him about his dangerous behavior tracy lays into his former superiors about being saps jane comes up behind him and as tracy turns to shoot mal fires instead knocking the young man to the ground oh I mean, right, first off, you you shot at Wash. Huge mistake. And whether you whether you intentionally just skimmed him, which would I I mean the chances of just skimming someone with a bullet is like slim, mm. right? You're like, oh, he could have started him clean in the head. Can you imagine if he killed Wash just then? Zoe would have like pulled the man apart yep. with her bare hands. She would have eaten him. Um So I love that I love how struck Tracy is. Like, oh, you've shot me. Like <laughs> You just shot my husband in the face. Yeah. 
right? <laughs> yes, I'm damn well going to shoot you, boy. Like, <laughs> And then he goes and takes poor Kaylee, who we know from like previous episodes is not, you know, at home in a gunfight and does not enjoy that kind of confrontation. Bless her. He was like sweet talking her a minute ago. What a dick. What a dick. <laughs> no more flirting. But, you know. You're the human shield now. Poor form. But he's gone into like proper defense mode, right? He genuinely is just like, does not want to die. He does not want to be caught. He does not want to have these organs ripped from his chest. He does not want to die. And he's just in full panic mode, um, which unfortunately comes out as him being a total tool. What a bellend. So <laughs> he's been shot now and uh, he's on the floor. Lieutenant Womack enters Cargo Bay with his goons. He tries to um, cow the smugglers with his alliance authority, but the unarmed book arrives to explain why he won't be using that authority. Given the pains he's taken to keep his extracurricular organ dealing activity from the local federal agents about eight sectors from his jurisdiction. Faced with a surprisingly direct threat of death from the preacher, Womack decides to depart, but not before telling Jane that wearing his mother's hat makes him look like an idiot. Which right there is grounds for death. But yeah, I, rem- I remember years back, I think it was on a uh, advert for like Cologne or something. I saw a line that I quite liked. It was, uh, Real power is a whisper, not a shout. Which I think perfectly is exemplified in this scene. He comes on, notices all the guns pointed at him. Womack's like, oh, I've been shot too many times to care about that. <laughs> I'm so badass. <laughs> With his, like, five guys backing him up, all with big guns and stuff. And then Shepard Book walks in, no guns, no armour, hands, like, clasped behind his back, gives no fucks, walks right up to him and is like, dude, no, leave right now. I know exactly what your game is, and we are not having it. Get out. Guy takes one look at him and is like, I'm sorry, I'm going to go now. Please don't put, please don't tell the authorities I'm a lying, cheating scumbag. And freaking leaves with his tail between his legs. It's like, mate, you're you're nowhere near as badass as you think you are. Like, you you're actually you are kind of a coward. So how about you just do one and stop pretending you're anything more than a wimp? Yeah, it's nice to see. Um, yeah, big dude with all of his goons and like talking the talk. I'm the worst. Blah blah blah. Fear me. Um, and then yeah, Shepherd Book just comes up, like you say, hands behind his back, no defense. Um whatsoever like just telling him how it is and he couldn't give yeah he, he doesn't care he's badass he knows that this guy's not going to do anything yeah. besides he's got he's got his new family crew to back him up Indeed. um should things go south but um yeah shepherd book man what a ledge so then they everyone everyone leaves and tracy belatedly realizes that book's confrontation was all part of their plan one that he screwed up by threatening the crew and getting himself shot for his efforts he asks man and zoe to deliver him home once more and then sadly dies speaking a phrase that's been repeated numerous times throughout the episode that harks back to their time in the war accompanied by some downhearted music and voiceover excerpts from the message the titular message the crew of the serenity solemnly return the fallen soldier to his grieving family and Joss. <laughs> what like what an end Doing to the, the freaking episode, man. Like it is like it is quite there are some quite somber moments in the episode and it's quite an introspective episode, but then there's also there's a lot of Jane being Jane, there's a lot of Wash being Wash, so it's quite kind of it's quite upbeat. And then you get to that last scene and it's like fuck just absolutely rips your heart out and then the credits roll like there is no trademark joss zinger to kind of bring the mood up at the end it just it finishes on that downer and it's like man that's just that's a tragic way to end the episode and when you know that you know it was the last one they ever shot it kind of it makes sense but oof i like the uh we didn't mention it the 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 quote from the flashback about uh, someone's carrying a bullet for you. Oh, yes. Mal says. Yeah, and then he says that at the end. He's like, um, I just carried the bullet for a while. Yeah. Um, yeah. Cold fucking line. It's kind line. of like hard. Yeah, and Mal is really like, I think this is like the serious, the most serious we've seen him. Yeah. His facial expressions in, in this, are, like Nathan Fillion, are pretty like harsh and pretty kind of like, I look at him and I'm like, oh, 
Nathan, where yeah. are you? Who is this very serious like, this man isn't, this left isn't behind? Mal Reynolds, smuggler and head of the family. This is like this is Captain Malcolm Reynolds, the war veteran, like man who has seen his crew through one of the worst like, crushing defeats in Alliance history, or not a lot, independent history. Like there is real steel in this man. This is the first time he kind of get a, like a hard look at it mm. it's pretty scary and then obviously we have the line so in the message you don't hear the end mm. of the line um when you can't walk you crawl and when you can't cr- crawl and he just goes well you know the rest and then in the end he says obviously you find someone to carry you and i think that's very very like the amount of times in this show we have seen the crew members help each yeah. other carry each other um and it's kind of like ah, oh, that is like their ethos yeah. right that is like exactly what they are and like zoe and mal especially uh, well mal definitely especially with like the way that he thinks about his crew and he would do literally like anything for them and they too for him so it's kind of like yeah it's just really nice hits you right in the feels if you weren't depressed <laughs> enough already. Yeah. it really kind of sums up everything about his whole outlook on life like you gotta you know if you gotta support your people if you support them, they'll support you. And it just, it, you know, it makes Tracy's portrayal all the worse because you know, like, he's, Mal has probably brought his whole squad up believing, yeah, if you, if you can't walk or crawl, if you can't crawl, someone will carry you. And then to be, to be carrying someone and have them use that as an opening to stab you in the back is like, it hurts twice as much because you know that yeah. you would never do that to them. So, yeah. And then it's obviously like sad as well because of Tracy's realization that like, oh, they weren't going to hand me over. Everything would have been, if I had not pulled that gun out on the bridge, right, then everything would be fine. These guys would have left and they would have taken me back uh, to my home planet. Although I'm sure he would have been, they would have gone back and found him at a later date after the Firefly left, right? I don't think he would have been safe. So it's kind of like this was the only way it could really go. Probably, yeah. Yeah, there was like, a chance of him getting home safely um but yeah it's just like oh you had a plan all along and i fucked it up yeah like <laughs> what an idiot yeah. i'm sorry i'm gonna die now like <laughs> but it's yeah, just... tracy is quite a sad character really when you kind of when you, when you take a step back and kind of not forgive him but when you kind of understand why he did what he did he is quite a tragic character like and he, he says it a few times during the episode so i think it's in the message we went to the war not expecting to come back, but it was real life we could I couldn't handle. Like he's he wasn't he, he was just kind of a disaster of a person. He you know, he had his place in the military, even if it, his place was eating beans. And then he came home and it's like he just didn't know what to do with himself, and so he ended up being an organ smuggler. It's like you just you you aren't you aren't an adult. You can't look after yourself. You need someone like Mal to be in charge. You have to wonder in an alternate lifeline lifetime you know, could he have joined the crew of the serenity and would he have been a better person if he'd stayed with mal and Liam mal had kind of raised him right <sighs> yeah i still can't help but uh just think of bill murray <laughs> I'm the only one that thinks it. Let, let me know in your letters, like. But like when he speaks and the way that he acts, I'm just kind of like, oh, it's a young Bill Murray. Now I can't unsee it's that. So thanks funny. for that. Now you can't unsee it. But um, yeah, he's um, it's the voice. It's the voice. But uh, yeah, I mean that kind of wraps us up for this episode. But we've got um, what I'll do is we'll let you guys listen to a voice message, um, and then we'll have our final thoughts because I kind of wrap up my response to this voice message in with kind of like my final thoughts so basically we have a a voice message thank you very much from Steve Brown which we'll let you listen to now hello the nervous podcast this is Steve and I just got done watching Ariel and I'm about to watch war stories and then trash and and kind of seeing my thoughts but I, I wanted to say something about Ariel I really like it as an episode because it really does it sets up the next episode because you know, they, they get the medicine and then the whole catalyst for the next episode is Wash wanting to do something different with the medicine. So that's that's how these all tie in together. <laughs> I know you've already covered it, but the, the I'll be in my bunk line from Jane gets me every time in War Stories. <laughs> and I love, what are we going to do, clone him? <laughs> from Jane as well. <laughs> and I love Book's response to this, the, the good book is some of your... Somehow fuzzier on kneecaps. 
Love Shepherd Book. One glass. So good. <laughs> I shaved off my beard for you, devil woman. From Trevor Stories. Treasure Stories. Tre- treasure Stories. I, I guess it's just called Trash. That's true, what she says about Mal and um, Monty. Even, even if you haven't had combat together, uh, if you've served together or just you know you wrote that, there's a bond, man. There's a bond. And, and Trash is great because Trash sets up for what could have been the future of this series. So, And, of course, finally, Trash, they have Saffron uh, with them. I don't know where I was on that. All right. Uh, love the podcast. Talk to you later. Thank you very much, Steve Brown, for that voice message. It was fantastic. I love hearing, yeah. you know, your favorite lines and thoughts on the show. This episode for me had a lot of absolutely great moments. And I think that it shows us like the real heart of everyone, um, how they all re- react differently to death. And, you know, even the death of someone they don't know and it's hitting them really hard, we see. It shows us that the crew, whilst technically criminals, um, are all really good people and still you know, feel for someone that's died and they're going to do their best to, like, get him home. Um, But the episode, although I think it's, like I said earlier, kind of, like, mellow and a lot more, like, deep and emotional than than the rest, like you said, Tyg, it's kind of, like, it's still filled, obviously, with hilarious Mm. moments, fantastic quotes, like, twists and turns and surprises. It's just, like is a really great episode. <laughs> yeah, it's not hard to see why it's one of the fan favourites. I've got to say that this episode has a little bit of, it's kind of developed a little bit of extra weight in its post-life. Because, if you notice, John Woodward, he was in Buffy, he was in Conversations with Dead People. Then he arrives in the last two seasons of Angel as Knox, and then he shows up in this as uh, Tracy, obviously. But then you notice... He's conspicuously absent from Dollhouse. He doesn't show up there. Now, it could be because there just weren't enough episodes to fit him in, even though you have to think he probably would have been quite good as a certain scientist, but whatever, we'll move on. And then you remember the story about behind the scenes at Firefly, where apparently in one episode, a guest actor who was just there for one episode playing a minor part of... Uh, got a little rude with some of the female cast. And uh, apparently Nathan Fillion had to get, and I quote, quite Canadian with him and see him offset. And you have to think, given who was in the show, given everything that happens, there is a very good chance that it was Jonathan Woodward that was the one that was being not quite polite to the female cast. And you have to wonder given what we know about everything in the whole situation, a guy that constantly plays people that seem really nice and then turn out to be jerks, is it possible that actually in real life he is just a bit of a dick? And that's kind of, like, I really feel sorry for the character of Tracy in this episode. He's a, he's, a, he's a very kind of relatable character. He's just a bit of a disaster. And that's one who's a bit of a disaster themselves. I really connect with him on a spiritual level. But then the whole episode, despite being one of my favourites, is kind of, tinted with a little bit of dirt beyond anything that may already be on the episode in the Whedon verse as a whole. Like, is this guy actually a dickhead? And is that why he mysteriously disappeared from the verse? And yeah, just, I love the episode, but it does put a bit of a tinge on it that I can't help but see now when I watch it. I mean, who knows? Maybe I'm imagining things. Maybe that story isn't even real. Maybe it was some, maybe it was, uh, Womack, which would be in fitting with his character, who was a bit of a bit of a dick. So who knows? But yeah, I don't know. It throws me off. Mm. Yeah, but it's, you're right that it is weird that like um, an actor that has been used repeatedly would not have even a small part in in a show like Dollhouse that has so many opportunities to have. Do you know what I mean? Like a cameo actor. I mean, um, you have to in. wonder, given the roles he's played in the past, he would have been quite good as Topher. I'm glad he wasn't, but. Oh, I'm so glad. Frank Kranz is just Legendary. like amazing. Literally my favourite character in the whole series. One of the best one of oh, the best character so arcs good. in the entirety of the Whedon verse. And I really wish we could have seen because we kind of we see how it begins, we see how it ends. I really wish we could have seen 
the middle because that must have been a hell yeah. of a journey. <sighs> he has possibly one of the best character arcs like in anything I've ever watched. Yeah. Um, and him especially paired with DeWitt as well <gasps> to see how they both kind of like, yeah. Uh, I just... I love that show so yeah, much. Yeah, I love him so much. He's so good. And you're right. If there had been an, even at least one more season, because like in the second season when you see his development with... Um, with everything he goes through with Boyd mm. over Sierra and stuff like that. And he literally, you literally see this character like develop a soul yeah. because he was obviously, he's just like this nerdy kid who's really into computers. And when he gets this job, because he's a genius and he's into computers, he doesn't really think about how it affects people. Yeah. You know, he doesn't, he doesn't connect the two. And throughout the season, he develops feelings and empathy for, for these yeah. people and uh, yeah, it obviously ends up saving saving the world. So. He's actually responsible for one of my favourite scenes in the entirety of the world. It's in one of the first episodes, or kind of one of the middle episodes of season two. It's after I don't want to get into spoilers, but it's it's after a certain reveal about a character, and yes, there's when he's because he lives in the dollhouse and there's a scene with him and the character in question in the server room where he's been sleeping and he wakes up and the character's there and they have this conversation and it's just one of the best scenes mm. for the for dialogue and for emotion and for character growth in anything i've ever seen if you haven't seen dollhouse go and watch it get to that episode i don't need to, i don't need to specify anymore when you get to the episode when you get to the scene you will know exactly know. what i'm talking about and it's just one of the most perfectly crafted scenes in television history. And I'll never stop telling people to watch it. Yeah. Like Firefly is a great show to just sit and watch and enjoy. And it's hilarious and brilliant. Dollhouse is like on this whole other level of just crazy, awesome TV. Like, it, And again, we mention it every week, but it's like it missed it missed its place in the world. Yeah. Like. Honestly, if it, yeah, I don't know. I, it, one of those things, you want people to know it and love it. And it's like, it's never going to happen. No. It's never going to like suddenly become a cult thing, I don't think. It should. Um, but it totally should. Like, why is... I'm just thinking, it's Fox, isn't it? So yeah. like, it, but I, So Buffy, Angel and Firefly are all on Disney Plus. Because uh, so. they purchased Fox. Yes. But Dollhouse, as far as I'm aware... Is not. Do you know, um, I hadn't noticed it until you brought it up. Yeah, you're right. It's the only I've, Fox British, Sweden property that isn't up there. I'm pretty sure I've scrolled through everything on Disney Plus and I don't think it's on there. Um, whether it's co-owned or released by another uh, company. Possible. Or something, I'm not sure. But um, yeah, because even if it was just on like the Disney Plus and people could like kind of find it. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? I feel like people would, would like it. Yeah. Um, I mean, given the meteoric rise of shows like Westworld, I can't help but yeah. think people that have seen Westworld are like, wow, that was really good. I wish I could see something like that, but a bit funnier. They would absolutely love Dollhouse. I yeah. mean, it's a very similar sort of idea, very similar plot arc, but without... Okay, so it's like, if you take Westworld and get rid of all the Red Dead Redemption stuff, you'd have Dollhouse. Yeah, and I think as for a two season show, there's two maybe three episodes that like are a bit slow and yeah. a bit kind of like not not much happens. This you you know you could not watch that episode and it would be you know yeah. not abysmal, but um, like that's not bad for like a two season mm. show. Um, and they're really just filler episodes that all TV has. Oh, yeah. um, do you know what I mean? But other than those like two three episodes, the the story development and the action and the just everything that's happening is yeah it's just fantastic i miss that but, show. um we're coming to the end of our of our firefly watching as well we are you know it's it's getting near very near the end now and uh what we got two episodes i believe so yeah Which, and then the film we have Yes. Oh, and the film. I can't wait. Yeah. So, yeah. So our next episode is, yeah, Heart of Gold. But, and then obviously we have our final episode. But then we get to watch Serenity, the joy Ooh. that is Serenity. Oh, yeah. Cannot oh, wait yeah. for that. <laughs> yeah, I love it. It's one of my favourite all-time films. It's um, it's just fantastic. 
And that's not just because of a Firefly fan, <laughs> because I did watch it. I did. I watched the film first, Same. and it was up there with my favorite films before uh, for a good couple years before I got round to actually watching Firefly. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's just brilliant. But we've got a couple of episodes to get through before we get there. We do. But um, yeah, I will take this opportunity as we're wrapping up this episode to thank our listeners. Thank you again to Steve Brown for your voice message. Feel free to send in any emails, letters, uh, discussion points, questions, anything you want to talk to us about. Um, you know, we go on tangents all the time. It doesn't even have to be necessarily totally 100% Firefly, yeah. but obviously if it is, we'll give it a good discussion. Um, you can send any of those talking points to fireflybits at gmail.com. And uh, I'll go over to Tyg now for the synopsis of our next yeah. episode. Yeah, big thanks to Stephen Browncoat for the message. And next week... We are watching Heart of Gold, a companion trained friend of Inara's who runs a small brothel, calls for help from the Serenity when a local bigwig reveals his intentions to take his, in heavy air quotes, baby from the girl he's impregnated. What a dick. What a dick. Yeah, just thinking about that as you read the synopsis, I'm kind of like, this is the first episode where like they've been called for help and it's not like a job. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Is this the first? Yeah. I think so. Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah. it's just- Crazy. Technically, that happened in this episode, but that was more, that was more kind of mm. the, 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 desire, the desire for help was thrust upon them. Whereas now they are they, they're doing it properly. They're asking, "Can you please help me? Not just yes, drop my please. dead body on your freaking doorstep <laughs> like I'm mental." Oh, by the way, I'm in a lot of trouble, and you're getting me from A to B. But I'm already on your ship, and there's not really anything you can do about it. <laughs> no. Just, uh, FYI. you know, <laughs> FYI. <laughs> Bad guys chasing me. <laughs> now chasing you, <Yeah>. Soz. <laughs> oh, man. This poor crew. Uh, Will they ever get a break? No. <laughs> no, is the answer. But yeah, thank you, uh, everyone, for listening. And uh, we will see you next time on Firefly Back in the Skies. Bye. Bye. I do love that episode.